So you're lacking assurance, are ya? Roll it, fellas. This is Ernest. <laughs> I'm gonna die! Give me a hug. You are gonna love this! Hello, and welcome to Wretched. My name is Todd Friel. I am your host, the Wretch. The song refers to... Uh, uh, assurance. Is it possible that you, dear Christian, right now are lacking confidence that you are God's child because you are smarting under the rod. That tends to be the connective tissue between lacking assurance and situations in life. When things are going well, praise God, this is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in a good day, but when it's a bad day, oh no. Does this mean God doesn't love me? The answer to that question is a definitive exclamation point. No, I guess the exclamation point would go at the end of the sentence. The point is when you, as God's child, are going through something hard, your response should not be, uh-oh, God doesn't love me. Uh-oh, I'm not saved. Uh-oh, God is punishing me for my sins. Instead, it should be, he loves me, and there must be something that he is trying to do for me because my father cares for me. Let's get over not having assurance because your circumstances in life are hard. To A.W. Pink, we go. When the believer is smarting under the rod, let him not say, God's now punishing me for my sins. That can never be that is most dishonoring to the blood of Christ. God is correcting you in love, not smiting in wrath. Nor should the Christian regard the chastening of the Lord as some sort of necessary evil to which he must bow as submissively as possible. No, it proceeds from God's goodness and faithfulness. And it's one of the greatest blessings for which we have to thank him. <laughs> Man, our brains need such rewiring, don't they? Something bad happens, and I'm inclined to go, uh-oh, he doesn't love me. No, I'm being punished for my sins, and the Bible teaches us just the opposite. Not, uh-oh, he doesn't love me, but, oh, he loves me, not, uh-oh, he's punishing me for my sins. That's impossible. Jesus was punished for your sins. Oh, he's discipling me. A.W. Pink said it this way, chastisement evidences our divine sonship. The father of a family does not concern himself with those outside it. Christian. If you're going through something hard, nothing escapes God's purview. He ordains everything, never doing anything to his children, but only things for his children that are good for his children, even when they're hard. That is not evidence he doesn't love you. It's evidence you're his child. Another quote from Mr. Pink, chastisement is designed for our good to promote our highest interests. Look beyond the rod to the all-wise hand that wields it. When you're going through something painful, difficult, challenging, emotionally draining, don't think that you are detached and you're just floating out there and, and, and God can't be found any place. You're not untethered. God's loving hand is doing this or permitting this for you, you can be assured of it. However, raises a question, doesn't it? Why? Why is God doing this for me? Well, there are at least three reasons. And number one, oftentimes God's chastenings are corrective. They are sent to empty us of self-sufficiency and self righteousness. 
They are given to reveal to us hidden transgressions and to teach us the plague of our own hearts. Is that a possibility? It sure could be. And you would do well to go looking under every rock to determine, is God dropping me to my knees to reveal something to me that I just wasn't getting any other way? Think back. Do you remember perhaps when you first got saved and all of your sins, they just, whoa, awful. And I am so glad to know about these because I hate these things because I love him so much. What if there were sins at that time you didn't see? And God, because he desires to change you completely into the image of his son, progressively so that you can look fully like his son, is willing to do hard things, permit difficult challenges to reveal more of those things so that you can kill those too? Wasn't it joyful when that first happened? God wants you, perhaps, to have that same joy by revealing sin to you through difficulties so that you can love him more. Another reason, according to Mr. Pink, again, the chastisements are sent to strengthen our faith to raise us to a higher level of Christian experience and to bring us to a condition of usefulness. In other words, God is doing that for you. And one more. Still again, divine chastisement is sent as a preventative to hinder pride, to save us from being unduly elated over successes in God's service. <laughs> Maybe you've been thinking you're kind of spanky. I've been doing this parenting thing really well. I don't mind telling you, my preaching, hoo -hoo, off the hook. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. And so God in his kindness will send difficulties, permit even evil things to happen because he wants a peaceable fruit of humility. Why? Because God only does good things for his children. When we return, we'll continue getting over a lack of assurance and yet making sure that we have a correct balance in understanding what God is doing in our difficulties and why it's better to be doing the things that don't cause the rod. Next on Wretched. Jesus Christ promised that he would build his church and even the gates of hell would not prevail over it. He's building his church through the distribution of his printed Word. Would you please support the ministry of Bible League International? Five dollars per Bible to a brother or sister who is longing for the Word. Would you please support Bible League? Wretched.org slash Bible. This is Karen. These are Karen's shoes. Karen claims she has nothing to do. All she does is twirl her finger in this pond all day. Sometimes she'll even try to grab the water. Don't be like Karen. Instead of needlessly poking water all day, go visit wretched.org for all things wretched. Where are your parents, Karen? Welcome back to Wretched. So you're going through something hard, are you? Well, that is very good. <laughs> oh, I know what I can Hard things are, you know, hard, painful things. They're painful. I'm not trying to minimize those things, but to put them in a biblical perspective, if you are God's son or daughter, nothing befalls you outside of his purview. God does nothing to his children. He only does benevolent things for them like a father who disciples a child is even willing to let the rod sting 
because there's a peaceable fruit that comes from a painful experience. God loves you so much, he is willing to let those things happen to you or cause those things to happen to you because he cares for you. What is he doing in those things? Well, it might be a preventative measure. If you, if you don't get laid low by something difficult in your life, you would be inclined to do something you would regret for the rest of your days. Isn't it kind of God to stop you from your own folly? Perhaps God is wanting to strengthen you, to cause you to rely on him. How many testimonies have we all heard? Somebody's cruising through life, everything is going pretty spanky overall. God lays them low with an illness and now they praise God more and they thank him for the infirmity because it causes them to rely on him more and love him more. Could God be doing that for you? Perhaps it's a preparation. That could be any, a reason that God is now preparing you as you are being comforted by his word and by his people to comfort others in their difficult time. You're going through this, you're being comforted, you're growing, all of a sudden, 17 years later, all of a sudden, somebody you know is going through the same thing and you get to walk alongside them to bring them the comfort that you've been comforted with. God might be doing that for you. Uh, perhaps, however, God is wanting to correct you. You're living in a certain way that he doesn't like, that doesn't look like his son. And because he loves you so much, he, he's, he's willing to bring the rod of correction to you. And isn't that a kindness? Now, there is something that is foundational to all of those things that God is doing, and that is his character and his nature. If God is a bully, if God is a terrorist, if God is just a simmering pot ready to boil over on you, uh, then, then all of these things would be interpreted as punitive or, 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 or as being retributive, uh, that he's just angry and he's just whacking me like an out of control father. His character and nature is crucial in understanding what God is doing for you. So what is God's character and nature? Got to settle that. Is God good or is God mean? How do we know that he's good? There's so many ways, but the best way, look, look at the cross. We, we need more evidence of God's goodness. He sent his son to die for you while sinning. God is good. And therefore, everything God does in your life is for you for your good, A.W. Pink put it this way, in divine punishment, God acts as judge. In divine chastisement, God acts as a father. The objects of divine punishment are his enemies. The objects of his divine chastisement are his children. Divine punishment, retributive. Divine chastisement, remedial. Divine punishment flows from his anger. Divine chastisement flows from his Love, that is your God, your father, you are the child, and because he loves you, he corrects those whom he loves. If you're stumbling in assurance because you feel like your circumstances, your difficulties are, are, are God showing you a malevolent face, it's not. It's a beneficent expression of kindness for you, that he loves you. It's not a malediction, it is a benediction. Now, how do you and I go about the business of living in such a way that God doesn't have to correct us as much? How can I start thinking how can I start believing so that my kind Heavenly Father does not need to come along with a corrective rod to get that sin out of me because he cares for me? Uh, there are many ways, but would like to take a look at a grand motivation for not desiring to sin. Not because we fear the sting of the rod, which ain't a bad motivation, 
But how's about because our sins, when we commit them as God's child who he has purchased, how's about our sins actually grieve our God? The adjective is important. He is the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Spirit. And consequently, because he is holy, he is grieved by impurity. It is therefore inevitable that he will be grieved by your sin and by mine. He is the Spirit of truth, and therefore he will inevitably be saddened by falsehood. That's why, as we saw this morning, Paul has said, having put away all falsehood, make sure that you speak in truth to one another, because not only does it have an effect on you and on your brother and sister, but it actually impacts the living God that the Holy Spirit is grieved when this takes place. How's about that for a motivation to not sin and end up being corrected by God? My sin grieves him. Does my sin cause him to go, that's a bummer. Well, tomorrow's another day. No, my sin, your sin, grieves God, and that should be a motivation to keep us from sinning, which will keep God from having to correct us. When we return, let's dive into the grief that you and I cause our God to feel, which will motivate us to keep from sinning, to keep from getting corrected, to keep from lacking assurance next on Wretched. In the Bible, Jesus is called the wisdom of God. The wisdom of man says we can earn God's favor through good works, but the wisdom of God is made known in Jesus Christ. God in human flesh, put to death on the cross to grant us forgiveness we cannot earn. first time I was pregnant, I remember the day. I have a 23-year-old, right? I don't want to do this all over again. And when I'm sitting there, the lady is giving me my ultrasound. When I first seen him, I was just like, can you tell if it's a boy or a girl? That's what I wanted to know. Like, I was excited. Then she's like, it's two. There was a difference. The, the girl was showing me my babies and everything on the monitor. I got to see it from my own eyes. Yeah, I'm happy now. Welcome back to Wretched. If your mother doesn't know you're doing that, your father most certainly does. Perhaps it's been personal. Somebody has actually asked you, not just in a movie, but they asked you, does your mother know that you're doing that? What's the intention behind that interrogation to cause you to go, yikes, if my mother found out about this, I'd be really ashamed. Why? because she would be so hurt. Therefore, I don't want to do that thing. Uh, Is that a proper motivation for correcting behavior? I think so. That somebody doesn't want to hurt somebody that they care for. They abstain from a behavior that will cause a wounding. And if that is true with our earthly mothers, how much more so with our earthly Father, so many people lacking assurance because God is correcting them. He's using a rod attached to a loving hand to keep you from sinning. How much better, however, to not be committing that sin, causing the rod, which might actually cause you to lack assurance when it should actually produce the opposite fruit. How's about we are motivated to not be doing the things that require God's correction. One of the ways that we can do that is by remembering that our sin grieves our God. Let's not forget the doctrine of impassibility, that God isn't skulking and, oh, I can't believe he did that because it just makes me feel so bad and I'm gonna be so embarrassed. No, God isn't 
emotional, but he has emotions. They are all predetermined. They are exactly the way that they should be. But nevertheless, it is clear when you and I sin, we grieve our God. We grieve him. It isn't a light thing when we sin. The Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, grieves when you and I do the things that we're not supposed to be doing. Shouldn't that motivate us to not do the things that cause him grief and to not say the things that cause him grief? Don't get drunk with wine. That's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And what is the impact? Well, then we will be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart and giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father and living in a mutuality of submission to one another that is quite remarkable in a world that is full of broken relationships. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit then, uh, what is to flow from our lips is that which is stirred in our hearts, namely praise to our God. Therefore, it is inevitable that he will be grieved when what flows from our lips is actually corrupting talk. The Holy Spirit is the God of truth. When you and I use our mouths to shade the truth or to tell lies, it grieves him. The Holy Spirit is pure. When you and I have filthy thoughts, it grieves him. The Holy Spirit is the God of kindness. When you and I are cruel to our spouses, to our children, it actually grieves him. The Holy Spirit is the God of peace. When you and I are frazzled and frantic and not trusting God, feeling like everything is out of control, it grieves him. The Holy Spirit is the God of joy. When we are lacking it, when we are ugh, all the time sinfully, it grieves him. The Holy Spirit is the God of infinite patience. When you and I are frazzled with one another, it actually grieves him. The Holy Spirit is the God of loving kindness. He is so good, and when you and I are so unkind and so bad, it grieves him. How might you and I escape the corrective rod of discipline from our Heavenly Father? Before we commit those sins, let's remember who our God is and what this behavior does to him. Why would we want our God, who died for us, to be grieved over our sin? If that is a struggle for you to do, to think about, because maybe the thought of grieving your God at this moment, well, yeah, I don't want to do that, but it doesn't grieve you to think of the grief that you cause your God. How might you change that perception and understanding? It's really, really simple. Go to the cross. What did your kind, loving, gracious, merciful God do because you and I sin, stripped, mocked, beaten, spat upon, hung on a cross for you. If you are perhaps lacking in your concern or care that God would be grieved over your sin, it is time once again to return to the cross, sit at its foot, Watch the blood drop before you that was shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, and you will grow in your love for your Lord, and the thought of sinning against him will absolutely grieve you. Surprise, next on Wretched.
There are not many things for kids to do, nor many ministries that make it to Eastern Europe. But Tomorrow Clubs do, bringing the gospel to kids in far-flung villages in Eastern Europe. Would you please support the Ministry of Tomorrow Clubs by supporting your own Tomorrow Club? $30 per month for 30 disciples. Please support a Tomorrow Club at tomorrowclubs.org slash wretched. Gonna give it about 12 seconds. Our new resource, Drive-By False Teaching, featuring Phil Johnson, Mike Favara's Studying False Teaching, not False Teachers, False Teaching. That way, if you don't remember, about 12 seconds, wasn't it? <laughs> and yet, I continue to futilely try. Please consider getting our new resource, Drive-By False Teaching, so that you can be knowledgeable about that which is false so that you can identify it when it inevitably comes sneaking into your church or home. Get your copy of Drive-By False Teaching at wretched.org slash false teaching. Welcome back to a wretched surprise. Yes, that's my Scottish accent. Todd, no it's not. Alistair Begg, a subject that eludes far too many of us. Assurance. I was thinking again about what it is that gives, gives one such an assurance of salvation. What is it that gives one such a conviction about the authenticity and the reliability and the sufficiency of the Bible? Why is it that we come together in this way and listen as we turn to the Scriptures again and again? Well, it is an indication of the fact that you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit assures you of these things. As you hear the Word of God, the Spirit of God is saying to you, this is true. He's saying to you, this must be applied. He's saying to you, see to it, and so on. It's a magnificent and a wonderful thing. If you are lacking oxygen, what do you need to do? Lament that you have no air? No, you breathe it in because that's what you need to get oxygen into your blood and, you know, live. The spiritual oxygen God has provided for us is His Word. If you're lacking assurance, you can be assured that God will assure you when you spend time in His Word, which was written by the Holy Spirit, who seals you, who uses the word that he wrote to assure you. If you continue to struggle with assurance, not only do you need to read the word, you need to believe the word. Sometimes we kind of jump over that. Well, I've been reading the word and it's not doing anything. But are you believing it? Spend time in it. Meditate on it and trust it and you will have assurance. And until tomorrow, go serve your king. Congratulations to Christine Dawson. You're the winner of today's free download, Expository Apologetics. You could win free stuff too if you sign up for the free Wretched newsletter at wretched.org. Wretched, amazing grace.